One of the most important questions that virtue ethicists face is the problem of the relationship between a good life in the sense of a flourishing or desirable life and a good life in the sense of an admirable life, a life of virtue. Remember that the Stoics thought that virtue is both necessary and sufficient for a happy life. If you're virtuous, you will have a desirable life, a life of eudaimonia. Aristotle's view was more tentative, since he thought that although we need the virtues in order to flourish, we also need goods of fortune, such as good health, financial resources, and a peaceful city to live in. Virtue is the part of a good life that we control. The other goods are a matter of luck. We can't choose our luck, but we can choose to be virtuous. Being virtuous is the best we can do ourselves to live a life that is desirable, a life of flourishing. I'm sure you can think of some problems with this point of view. For one thing, some of the most virtuous people die a premature death because of their virtue. Jesus died at 33. Martin Luther King was assassinated at 39. Sir Philip Sidney was an Elizabethan poet and courtier who was injured in the thigh during a battle with the Spanish and died of gangrene 26 days later. While lying wounded, he reportedly gave his water to another wounded soldier, saying, Thy necessity is yet greater than mine. How could virtue contribute to his flourishing? You can't very well flourish if you're dead. On the contrary, virtue seems to have detracted from his ability to live a flourishing life. Here is another example. It's described by Christine Swanton in her book on virtue ethics. A woman is an aid worker in the jungle. She suffers repeatedly from malaria and dysentery. She's often exhausted and discouraged does not have the comfort of religious faith, and she dies prematurely. Swanton judges that the aid worker's life is admirable, but it is not flourishing. That seems right to me, and I think Aristotle would have agreed. She would have flourished more, had a more desirable life, if she had not gone to the jungle, but had lived a more ordinary life near her family and friends. But it's hard to know how to interpret this case because we need more details about her alternatives. Her passion to help others might not have been satisfied in an ordinary life in her hometown. She was not happy, but maybe she would have been even more miserable if she had not gone to the jungle. But maybe we should not look at the extremes of virtue for Aristotle's point. Most virtuous people are not heroes or saints, just ordinary people who practice the virtues within the limits of their social and economic circumstances. Aristotle probably had people like that in mind when he argued that being virtuous, plus a bit of luck, is sufficient for happiness. The goods of fortune are beyond our control, but being virtuous is within our control. It is necessary for happiness, and with luck, it is sufficient. But here is another problem. Why should we think that being virtuous is necessary for living a desirable life? Aren't there people who are not virtuous but thrive even more than the virtuous? They have friends, money, a long, pleasant life, and they may live in a community that shields them from violence and other kinds of unpleasantness. They might not be extremely vicious, but they're not virtuous, and they get away with a bit of cowardice, a bit of unfairness, a bit of stinginess, and a bit of disloyalty and dishonesty and lack of self-control. With some luck, their vices are not enough to drive away their friends or get them arrested or ruin their health. Doesn't that mean that virtue is not necessary to live a desirable life? I think that Aristotle probably has the resources to answer this question, but I prefer a different approach. In my paper, The Admirable Life and the Desirable Life, I describe a different way to relate the two kinds of good lives, a life of virtue and a life of flourishing. The traditional approach that comes from Greek philosophy is to define and defend virtue by reference to a desirable life, a life of eudaimonia. My proposal is to do the reverse. 
It seems to me that we are very unclear about what a desirable life is like. We know some of its features, including health, financial resources, love and friendship, and freedom from suffering, but that does not tell us very much. In fact, even if that is supplemented by an account of the virtues, and we come to accept with Aristotle, that a desirable life requires living virtuously, that still does not tell us what to do all day long. It does not tell you whether to go to college and what to major in. It doesn't tell you whom to marry or whether to marry, how to handle your money, how to contribute to civic life, and all the hundreds of other choices, both large and small, that you need to make every day. My suggestion is that a desirable life is a life we would desire if we knew what the wisest people know about a desirable life. That leads to defining a desirable life in terms of what admirable persons desire. An admirable life is a life lived by admirable persons, persons whom we admire upon reflection. A desirable life is a life desired by admirable persons. When we look closely at admirable lives, I think we will see some similarities and many differences. We will see that admirable persons desire to live virtuously, so it is desirable to have the virtues. But we will see that they desire many other things that vary from person to person. I think that means there are lots of different kinds of admirable lives. To live the most desirable life for yourself, it is helpful to read stories, observe lots of people, and watch movies that depict many admirable persons because some are more relevant to the kind of life that would be desirable for you than others. Narratives show us the varieties of admirable lives, and even more, they show us disadmirable lives, lives you would not desire upon reflection. But those lives can be helpful too. It's good to know what you do not want to be. So what about the people who are virtuous extremes? the people who sacrificed their lives, like the aid worker described by Swanton or Sir Philip Sidney, or martyrs for freedom like Nelson Mandela who spent 27 years of his life in prison? If I'm right that a desirable life is what admirable people desire, then these lives were not desirable because nobody wants to die young or spend 27 years in prison. On the other hand, Philip Sidney, Nelson Mandela, and the anonymous aid worker might have lived lives that were as desirable as they could make them in their circumstances. It is interesting to see how extreme many admirable people are in their lives. They risk ordinary human goods in order to get some other good that they believe is worth the sacrifice, like freedom or a good life for other people who are suffering. Is their judgment wrong? If it is wrong, then why do we admire them? If it is right, then we have to admit that an admirable life is desirable, even if we can't always appreciate that.